Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome senior editor, The Atlantic, Richard Florida. Thank you. We are living through the greatest economic transformation in human history, and the APEC region and the APEC nations are the centerpiece of that transformation. Um, one of the things we heard, we just heard from President Obama, is that going through this period of economic and financial crisis, we've been able to weather this storm much better than the great crises of the past, and a critical part of that has been tremendous international and interregional cooperation. Uh, I've sat through the discussions of the past couple of days, and I listened intently to the ongoing conversation. But one thing I, I feel that's missing from this dialogue is a true understanding of the depths of the current restructuring, what I call a great reset, and the nature of the structural transformation we're going through, and just exactly what we need to do as individual nations, as regions, and as cities to put us on a path to renewed and sustainable prosperity. You see, the entire nature of our economy has changed. We are switching from an old, industrial, organizational, and bureaucratic age to a new age of innovation, of knowledge, and of creativity. And the APEC nations stand at the forefront of that transformation. Uh, as we move through crises, one of the things that we understand as great resets unfold is that these are periods of remarkable innovation. Now, there are those who will tell you that we're going through a period of economic and technological stagnation. They'll tell you that the rate of innovation has slowed down. They said the same thing in the 1930s. A great economist called that a period of secular stagnation, but when historians went back and looked at the data, they found that the single most technologically progressive decade of the 20th century was the 1930s. A quick look at the rate of innovation, a new study by MIT economists, our own research at the University of Toronto, convinces us that we are in the middle of a renewed upsurge and uptick in innovation. But it's more than just technology, it's more than just research and development. As Mrs. Clinton said yesterday, the key is to unlock the full human potential of each and every one of our citizens. You see, it's not just an age of knowledge, of technology, of innovation. This is a shift from an industrial to a creative economy. For all of human history, for all of human history, we powered our economies on natural resources, on physical labor, and on large-scale industry. We are now shifting to a system where human potential can be maximized and where the key to growth lies in unlocking the creativity of each and every single human being, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of sexual orientation. That's the key. We just released a report from our institute, the Martin Prosperity Institute at the University of Toronto. We benchmarked every country in the world on our new global creativity index. The APEC nations have embraced this shift. In the year 1900, if you look across the advanced world, not more than 5% of the workforce were members of the creative economy, were participants in what I have dubbed the creative class. By the year 1950, we had become an industrial system. Still less than 10% of the workforce of the advanced countries were members of the creative economy. Today, across the world and in the APEC region, we have embraced creativity, and our creative workforce has grown. And the United States added 20 million new jobs in the creative class. 35% of its workforce are members of the creative economy. In Mexico and the Philippines, it's already 20%. In Malaysia, it's 25%. In the United States, I mentioned it's 35%. In Canada and New Zealand, 40% of the workforce today are members of the creative class. Scientists, technologists, innovators, working in R&D, educators, knowledge workers, arts, media, entertainment, and culture. In Australia, it's 45%. And the highest level of the creative economy in the world, the country that has embraced it most fully, where 48% of its entire workforce is in the creative class, is Singapore. 
This means the key to work. Now, that is as high as the industrial blue collar workforce was in the heyday of the industrial water. We have to stimulate that creativity. We have to stoke that creativity. We have to harness that creativity, not only in R&D and innovation, in startup companies. It's the only way we will rebuild our manufacturing base in those nations that have been hard hit. It's the only way we can upgrade our capabilities in agriculture and farming. The rise of the creative economy poses great challenges, and one that we have seen in the advanced countries, particularly in the United States, but also in Canada, in many of the Asian countries and across Europe, has been rising economic and social inequality. That's the way economic transformations happen. Economic and social inequality is a product of rapid and radical economic change. As knowledge has accumulated, as creativity has marched forth, as innovation has occurred, our labor market has been pulled in two. And here's a challenge for all of you. People talk about the need to upgrade our workforce skills and to educate more people. People talk about the need to improve manufacturing, and both of those are key. But across the world, more than 50% of our workforce works in services. They're the people who take care of our aging parents, who take care of our kids, who take care of our homes, who serve us food, who take care of us when on the road and in hotels. We consider those low-skilled jobs. We have to make those high-skilled jobs. We have to reinvent service jobs if we're going to close this groaning gap in inequality. We have to view each and every individual as a source of creativity and unlock that creative talent as a source of continuous innovation. Now, there's something else that's changing in our world of technology and globalization. People have told us that with the onset of new technology, the internet, communication, logistics, we have embraced a new global world, which is flat, where we have conquered distance and geography, where place and community do not matter anymore. The age of creativity and innovation is not flat. In fact, it makes cities and communities more important than they ever have been. More than 50% of the world's population lives in cities. The percentage is much higher in the APEC nations. Urbanization the creation of concentrated and clusters of economic activity is as important to economic growth as technological change and human capital and skill accumulation. We are living in a world of globalization that is clustered, that is concentrated. Our world isn't flat, it's spiky. And the APEC nations stand at the forefront of that change. I listened to the Cities of the Future panel yesterday and was particularly struck by Mayor Daley's remarks. He talked about the rise of the megacity and the rise of the city-state. My own research has benchmarked the new economic nature of the creative global economy. The rise of the mega-region, clusters of regions, the Shanghai-Beijing access, the Mumbai-Bangalore corridor, the Boston-New York-Washington corridor, for Mayor Daley, the Chicago-Detroit-Pittsburgh access. Those are the economic organizing units of our time. There are 40 of these mega regions that dominate the world economy. The APEC nations include four of the top five and 25 of the 40. Those mega regions house but 10% of the world's population. They produce 50% of our economic output and account for nearly three quarters of our innovations. One of the things that you have to do going forward in this summit as business leaders, as political leaders, is take the issue of our cities and mega regions seriously. Look, folks, if the industrial corporation was the social and economic organizing unit of the industrial age, if the rhythms and patterns of the industrial corporation structured our lives and powered growth, I submit to you that our cities our mega cities and our mega regions are the social and economic organizing unit of our time. They are where new ideas and new innovations come from. They are the organizing structures like the Silicon Valley, where people can combine and recombine and create new ideas and build new startup companies that set forth those gales of creative destruction. Well, the APEC nations have taken leadership too. In China, investments in high speed rail which other nations, including the United States and Canada, as well as other Asian nations, need to understand, which can speed the velocity and flow of goods, people, and ideas, and help propel, propel economic growth. 
And we need to bring more city leaders and mayors to the table. As Mayor Daley said, it is the mayors of the world who are on the ground understanding the changes and the public-private partnerships that are ongoing that are key to our time. We are in the middle not only of a financial and economic crisis, we are in the middle of the greatest structural transformation in all of human history. And we have much to look forward to. We have many challenges, but a great opportunity. You see, the key to our economic growth in the future no longer depends on natural resources. It doesn't anymore depend on having giant buildings or even the best industrial corporations. Those nations, those communities, those cities and regions that will lead and succeed have but one key resource that we can harness, and it's one that is limitless and indivisible. We need to tap the collective creativity that lies deep within each and every one of our people and bring that together in vibrant communities and cities that can lever and organize that change. I hope you're up for the challenge, and thank you for having me.